I recorded a bit of last time. Um, all right, so the final exam is open. And it's, it's pretty much an overview of the entire course, overview of important topics. And it doesn't have every single topic in it, but it's just basic programming. But I think that the um, questions are challenging enough, so you know you won't just immediately get it. It'll take it'll take some thinking. Some thinking is required, but it's not so hard that only one person is going to get the answers, right? It's it's designed so most people will be able to do this if you put in the time and effort. So let's see. I found the vector assignment was beyond like the four and five. Um, let's see, somebody's unmuted. Let's see, Jennifer, do you want to say something? I guess not. Um, so yeah, I think the final exam is um, uh, requires you to think. It requires you to um, pay attention and submit your assignments on, on Memer. Um, but really, the, the important thing is there's no extensions. No extensions. Right? Well, I mean, you know, there definitely should be in a programming class some challenging problems. Challenging problems in a programming class. If if we left the programming class and everybody said, oh, every single assignment was so easy, I never had any, never had any trouble with any single one, then that would be way, way too easy. So you definitely want in a programming class for there to be a bit of a challenge. Um, the issue is you don't want it to be so challenging that people just give up and say, oh, I can do nothing, it's impossible. I mean, that, that's true of the sites that we visited, right? Like, we've done a lot of problems on Project Euler. We can just go here and see in the archives that they have problems where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have solved them. And then if we go to the last page, we have some problems where, you know, barely a hundred people have solved them. So... You know, 102 people in the whole world, 102 people in the whole world have solved this problem. So, you know, if, if there was a introductory programming class, yeah, exactly, and the, the instructor said, everybody must solve this problem, right? Seven, how do you know 75% in the U.S.? Oh, because it's in English. Well, I mean, English is what all programming languages are really in. Like... I can't think of a major programming language not in English, but um, maybe maybe there's like a other programming languages I don't know of. That's a good question. Are there any programming languages not in English? I really don't know. I've never I've never thought about it. But if somebody could look that up and and see, that would be kind of interesting. So I guess getting back to this point about how difficult this problem is, there's there's no reasonable way to expect that people would be able to solve this, like in just a introductory class. It would be almost impossible, right? So you need, you, and, and also you could play gotcha with instructors. You could pick out the hardest problems on a site like this. Uh, let's see, there are, but most foreign countries make their students learn English anyways. No, but what, what are the 
<laughs> yeah, binary is not in English. That's true. That's true. Zeros and ones. No, that's that's a good point. Um, so, you know, it, it's not that... Let's see. So we have non... Oh, wow. Very good. Two people at the same time did that. Let's see. I, I am curious about this. It's something I've never looked up. So let's go here to Wikipedia and look up non-English based programming languages. Okay. Um, the use of the English language is the inspiration for the choice of elements, in particular for keywords in computer programming languages and code libraries. Um, according to the HAPL online database of languages, out of 8,500 programming languages reported, 2,400 were developed in the U.S., 600 in the United Kingdom. Okay, so a third of all programming languages have been developed in countries where English is the primary language. Let's see. Okay, so it goes back to the 60s. I'm just looking for keywords in another language. Okay, so here are some languages with keywords in Arabic. All right, so so actually there are quite a few. I've just never heard of them. Wow, there's a computer programming language called Latino. I've, I've never looked into this, never looked into this. So maybe, maybe there is a, a big usage for some of these. Um, I don't know. Uh-oh, we have a bad word on here. A compiler that fits in fewer than... Compiler fit in fewer than 256 bytes. It's crazy. <laughs> well, um, you know, in, in the future, we don't know, in, in 100 years, 100 years... Mandarin might be the dominant language, right? We don't know. Um, the Chinese, yeah, trip of brain fun, might be the dominant by far. Who knows? Like, we don't know. Um, certainly, there was a time when French was the language people used. And, I mean, Latin because of the Romans. But, um, you know, these, these sort of things change. Right now, it would seem in computer science, really, really would help you to, to know English. But, um, yeah. Anyways, uh, let's, let's go ahead and close this down. And why don't we take a look at what your final exam looks like. So if we go here to Lemur Classroom, we can see that we have two new assignments called Final Part 1 and Final Part 2. And let's see, we have a comment here. I hope we invent a language that takes the best of the top five most popular languages or something like that. And definitely, that that is possible, right? Like, just because we're talking about C++, which comes from the late 70s, early 80s, that, that doesn't mean that that has to be the language you guys would keep using. I mean, um, some people in here might be interested in language design. You know, there was, there was a, a code jam on Replit. It was called a language jam. A language jam. And the idea was to make small teams of people interested in making up their own languages and to talk about what their languages would do, try to see what it would take to get their language working on Replit. And it was really interesting. So when I first saw it, I, I copied it and pasted it into our Discord. So I pasted the link into Discord. All right. But the thing is, um, you know, I thought about it and I said, wait a minute. How many students are really, really that into language design? So I actually ended up deleting the link. 
I deleted the link because I said, you know what? It's it's a very rare student who's like really passionate about new programming languages, and not like as a diss to anybody. It's just that that sort of topic is super advanced. No, it is. It was really cool. Like it, it seemed really exciting. Um, it's certainly something I've never done. I've never thought to make my own language. Um, it's just not something that's ever been on my radar, like my aptitude, my interest. Um, what do you, well, that's a great question. So sometimes people use other languages. Uh, sometimes people use assembly, but um, it just depends really what the goals of your language are. So they sometimes talk about bootstrapping a language um, bootstrapping a language where you use the language to make the language. Um, I have had very few students throughout my time at Miami Dade. I think I need two P's in that. That doesn't look right. Bootstrapping language. All right. So one student um, was interested in making his own language, and he actually started putting it up on GitHub. Um, but I don't know, I could, I could fall down the rabbit hole of looking up his GitHub, putting it up there, but, um, I think that's, that's probably not a good use of time. So I'll, I'll leave that. But there are some people who are really interested in language design rather than just using languages written by other people, but we'll, we'll leave that for now. Okay. So final part one. So we go here and we see people have already started it, which is great. And then we can go here and look at preview, preview assignment. We see it's a mixture of multiple choice and coding problems. So the coding problems give you constraints, read in a string and print out information about the string in this format. You get multiple attempts to do it. But it's, it's really just basic usage of strings, like for this particular question, right? How do you get the first letter? How do you get the last letter? You'll see that I wrote, all work must be your own on the final exam. So the nice thing is Memer added in the MOS test, which will check to see what is the indentation like? What are the variables like? Things like that. So I think that's, that's really helpful, getting people to do their own work. But um, it's nothing too crazy difficult. It's just an overview about the language. So you do part one, and then you go into part two. And you can see part two is also pretty similar. You've got multiple choice. And then you've got coding problems. So let's see, what is coding problem, what is question six like from part two? The Spaghetti Code Cafe uses a computer program to keep track of computer loyalty. Unfortunately, there have been many problems. Some customers complain that there have been, there have, that they have too few loyalty points. Others quietly take advantage when the computer tells them they have extra points. Revise the program to keep track of loyalty points for three customers, A, B, and C. So I really like this question because it gives you some code to work with. Work with the existing code. Because that's a really common thing for programmers to have to do. Work with code already written by others. So you see it's due in four days, 11 hours. And you just can't extend it. You have to get it all done before this time. As I understand it, the grades are due Saturday at 12.30. Okay? The grades are due Saturday at 12.30. Now, if... Yes, I opened it today. today. Um, if the college... Yes. If the college made some kind of mistake and says, oh, the grades are due at Friday at 1230 or something like that, well, I don't think anything chaotic like that has ever happened before. So we, we can be pretty sure the due date is when it 
I was told it was going to be due. Um, but I would recommend just get this done early. Don't wait till the last minute because I can't extend it. I can't be writing to you all night back and forth. You just have to get it done before that deadline. It's just too important. You got to get it done before that deadline. So um, those are the assignments. They're pretty straightforward. And that's that. Okay, so now if we go to Freer School, we can see the quiz on strings. Wait, no, that's not right. It's supposed to say quiz on strings. Hold on a second. There it is. That's the right one. I do have the quiz on strings open. Yeah, the quiz on strings is open, but I got to I got to fix something with the time. That's the issue. Okay, well, I'll fix that right now. Okay, so let's close this. Let's see. Okay, perfect. So now the quiz on strings should be open. Great. Okay, so it's just like all the other quizzes. I set this one due before. assignments. Okay, so see Mitchell typing out a question. Let's see. Uh, okay, we have final part one and part two and chapter 10 quiz. Yes. And then that's it. Then the semester is done. So what I did was I installed Moodle on a server and then I just tweaked it. Moodle. Moodle. So Moodle is an open source. Moodle is an open source course management system, and um, I guess learning management system is a better name. And the thing is, I've been in education for a long time, right? And there have been lots of things that have come and gone. So schools will pay for different things. And they'll pay for one year, they'll have Blackboard, and then they're, uh, oops, spelled no Blackboard wrong. And then another year, they'll have Canvas, Blackboard, and then they'll have Canvas, and then they'll have uh, 
educational networks, and then they'll have this, and then they'll have that. So many paid services. Okay, and the issue is there's time involved in setting everything up and in learning how to use the different systems. So for me, it's actually a lot, a big time saver just to have Moodle installed on my own server and then when they need an update, just update it. So updating is easier for me than using some of these paid services. Yes, yes, it really, really does because um, exactly, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And you know, when, when students go to um, the, like when students start the semester and they go to my page on, I think MDC still uses Blackboard, right? Like it is Blackboard. Um, yeah, they, I just have a link that takes them to Freer School. So that's, that's the rationale. Um, yeah, they actually pay quite a bit of money for, they pay quite a bit of money for, for Blackboard. Um, Blackboard costs MDC a lot of money and you know I asked the person who's like in charge of managing Blackboard I said yeah they pay a lot of money I said why don't we try Moodle and they said oh Moodle doesn't have good features blah 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 Blackboard is better so I mean I disagree with it because I like Moodle more but I mean, there. I guess there are some people on the campus who like Blackboard, but um, it gets the job done. It's in the end. It's in the end. It's not really super important. Um, I like the cost too. The free aspect is is really important. But you know, like in terms of the the platform people use, the platform isn't the most important thing, right? I mean, that's true. All, all I pay for is the domain and hosting. You don't even need that much hosting for what I do. I mean, within reason, the platform isn't the most important thing. Like if you have something that hardly ever works and is really terrible. But I mean, just for instance, with Discord at the beginning, I had some students who really wanted me to use a Microsoft product in another class. They wanted me to use Microsoft Teams. They said, oh, Microsoft Teams is so much better, and um, it's Discord is for gamers, and blah, blah, blah. It's not as, as professional. And I said, no, no, I'm in all my other classes, I'm using Discord. I want to use the same thing for each, each class. And um, if there was ever, like, a tiny glitch on Discord, they'd say, see, see, it made a mistake. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. Guess what? Microsoft Teams has glitches too. <laughs> so you can't pretend that like one site is so much more perfect. Yes, I think Discord is way more versatile. I think it's it's got a lot of capabilities. Um, I, I just love so much about it. And I know I use only a small percentage. I use a small percentage of it. So I, I, I certainly don't pretend to be like a great Discord master. I think I've gotten a lot better as the semester has gone on. But it really does have tons of capabilities, a lot of features that I don't use. And hopefully when I start my Java class next semester, some of you are enrolled in it, I'll, I'll be able to explore some of the features during the time that we have off. And I'm looking forward to the first part being virtual. So the first part next semester of next semester is virtual. And then in person, let's see, it, the world if online classes use Discord instead of Zoom. Did you make that? Oh, I was going to say, wow, you really went to that meme maker fast and, and made that. Um, 
like one one decision I made was to not have cameras on everybody, not have cameras on everyone, because when I do virtual classes with other people and I have to sit there and everybody's faces are up there, um, I find myself looking at my own face, looking at other people, and I. Yeah, I don't even know what's the purpose. I'd rather I'd rather have the code as the focus. So that's just like my thought process. It's not like, I mean, it's not a big deal if I turn my camera on, um, but I'd much rather have a focus on the code instead of like a focus on uh, how everybody's hair looks or whatever. So that, that's just sort of my thought process on, on that. Um, who knows? Whatever. I mean, you guys see my picture right there, so it's not like there's anything hidden. But, um, okay, anyways, enough about Moodle, enough about all this. Let's start with today's lesson, and I think, I think you're going to find it to be a pretty important lesson. We're going to talk about structured data. So let's begin with the, with the slideshow for structs. And let's just drag this up here. Okay, structured data. So we won't finish with all the slides, but we'll finish with quite a few. All right, let's see. So we got some comments here. It says here, <laughs> schools, a trusted good source of video chat that most students already understand how to use. <laughs> and then schools, an app no one's heard of, yes. That is pretty funny. And let's see, Mitchell writes here, Google open sources its language interpretability tool. Google AI researchers have made the language interpretability tool, LIT, an open source platform for visualizing, understanding, and auditing natural language processing models for third party developers. Wow. Pretty cool. Let's check this out for a second. Um, why AI models make certain predictions? Can these predictions be attributed to adversarial behavior or to undesirable priors in the training set? Lyft calculates and displays metrics for entire data sets to spotlight patterns in model performance. Very cool. Wow. Well, I mean, certainly we can all agree that, that big changes are happening. I mean, artificial intelligence, AI, has been promised since the early days of computers, right? So I think when computers first came out, way back in the 1940s, people started talking about this. And actually, Alan Turing thought about this question. Have you guys ever heard of the Turing test? So, yeah, that's, that's where Alan Turing said, if you can communicate with a computer and you don't know whether you're speaking with a computer or a person, then computers have achieved artificial intelligence. And I think that for a long time, these promises were just so overblown. But I think now, because of the... Yes, neural networks have been around for a long time, but now that we have so much data, so much data seems to make the difference. Right? So, well, there's actually, um, scam bots can be pretty convincing. Yeah, they're, they're definitely getting better. I mean, 
if you look at Eliza chatbot, Eliza was, yes, that was a cool video. I remember seeing that one. All right, so here's, here's Eliza. This is a chat bot from the 60s. So you can see it's, it's somewhat primitive if you give it a try later. But um, really, you need to talk about yourself and your life for it to you know, have any like sense. But you see they put this up in the 90s. And I guess they made a translation of it from the 60s to the 90s. And here we are in 2020. We can still test it out. But, you know, that's, that's just one aspect of AI. But um, certainly huge, huge changes have been afoot. And it's definitely worth keeping up with. Okay, so let's go ahead and now open up our slides about structs all right here it is structured data you know one of the things uh, about teaching a course online like this is when people bring up different links or questions or comments, it may take us away from the original chapter. But if we just wanted to see videos of structured data, we could just go on YouTube and find some really popular, well done videos on structured data. But I don't think that's the same thing as having like a natural conversation about something. And yeah, it is good to get back to the syntax, back to the syntax. But I don't look at those those links or discussions as any sort of wasted time because it's good to try to put it into a whole understanding of, of what's going on with technology.